Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our August 2016 webinar, Logic Models, Getting Them Right and Using Them Well. I'm Miranda Lee from Western Michigan University, and I'm your host for today's webinar. With me here is Lori Wingate, Director of Evaluate, the Evaluation Resource Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. We are located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. Behind the scenes, making sure this webinar runs smoothly, we have Mike Lisecki, Janet Pinhorn, and Tim Suchomsky from Maytech at Maricopa Community Colleges. We would also like to thank Mike Rudabaugh from Lakeland College for his feedback on a draft version of this webinar. Please note the views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters, and they do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. A handout of key points and resources from today's webinar is currently available on our website. The presentation slides are there as well. We will also post a recording of the webinar within about one to two days, and we will email you the link when that's made available. Although this webinar has been created for individuals that are interested in applying for funding from NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, most of what we'll be discussing today is relevant to other programs and types of projects. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. In the ATE program, there are three main funding tracks, projects, centers, and targeted research. As you can see, there are many types of projects funded within these tracks that emphasize different ways of improving the quantity and quality of technicians working in fields that use advanced technologies. If you're thinking of submitting a proposal, this is a great time to start working on it if you haven't already. If possible, you should have your external evaluator lined up and working with you to develop your evaluation plan no later than a month before the submission deadline of October 6th. Although we won't focus on evaluation plans today, Lori will share some additional resources to assist you with evaluation plan development towards the end of the webinar. So please be sure to stay tuned for that. And now, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Lori. Thank you, Miranda. So this webinar is going to be presented um, in two main sections. First, we're going to go over how to create a logic model, and in the second part, we're going to talk about how to actually integrate a, module, mo a logic model specifically into a funding proposal. So again, in this first part, we're going to dive in and into how to develop uh, a logic model. I'm going to present base, some basic information and guidance that you'll need to start working on your own logic models. So this is sections mainly geared toward those of you who are new to logic models, but I do hope there will be at least some refreshers and some insights for those of you who are more experienced with them. So first of all, what is a logic model and why should we care? Well, basically, a logic model is a way of visually communicating what a project is going to do and what changes it seeks to bring about. So it's going to distill the main elements of a project into a picture that really illustrates its overall structure and logic. So here we have the typical elements you'll see in many logic models. But there are many variations as to what people will include in logic models, how the different elements are labeled and defined, and how they're presented and formatted. So here's a logic model of this webinar. Now, we normally wouldn't create a logic model for a single short event like this, but I did this to kind of give you a painless introduction into what logic models are. So I'm going to break this down into its component parts. So first we have inputs, and these are what enable you to do the work of a project. They're the resources and the assets that the project is going to use to do the work to bring about change. So for this webinar, we're able to bring it to you because we have funding from the National Science Foundation, as well as because of Maytech's uh, wonderful webinar hosting services. And in the third box, uh, I'm saying that this logic, mo um, this webinar is informed by lots of different resources that are already out there on logic models, and by feedback that we received from uh, Mike Rudabaugh, who's one of our uh, members of our community college liaison panel. So some general things to keep in mind with regard to inputs. 
I encourage you to focus on your project's special or important assets. So if you only, lots of times I'll see generic, very generic things like funding, faculty, expertise, and things like that. Um, I encourage you to get more specific. If you're just listing very generic things, it might not be worth the space in the logic model to include them. Um, as another example, say you have local workforce needs assessment data that you're using to inform your work. So use that language, you know, instead of just data or employment data or something like that. So activities, these are simply what a project does, the actions it takes to bring about intended outcomes. And these tend to be the easiest to kind of identify and describe. So for this webinar, the things that we, the main activities we do are to uh, advertise it, develop, rehearse, and improve it before the live event, and then, of course, the delivery of this live event. And here, in general, you want to focus on the delivery and development of services and products. So I recommend omitting activities that are more about project management or administration and things like that. It's not that those aren't important, but if you start adding in all of those details, it's quickly going to overtake your logic model. Again, you want to be as specific as you can in the limited space. And I would say if your project includes numerous activities, as many larger projects do, um, you can group them. You can group the related activities to illustrate the project structure. And that's also going to help make the information more consumable to others. So outputs are the tangible things that you're going to um, generate through the project activities. So these tend to be things that you can count and see and document directly. You can observe directly. And these also tend to be the things that are going to remain after a project ends. Now, the outputs um, or the tangible products that will stay around after this webinar is over include a recording, uh, the presentation slides, and our resource handout. And these are, will be available for years into the future, or at least until we feel like the content's outdated. So in general, here you want to highlight things that are really, uh, I would characterize as concrete evidence or artifacts of service delivery. It is common to see numbers um, listed along with that kinds of outputs, and that's, that's totally fine. Um, my stance on that is to include numbers only if they're really known or if certain thresholds are necessary in order to bring about the intended outcomes. So I do believe it's good to have targets, but um, I, I don't think those necessarily always have to go into the logic model itself. So next are the short-term outcomes, and these are going to be the immediate changes brought about by a project's activities and, and uh, products. And I really can't emphasize enough here that outcomes are about changes. So with regard to our short-term outcomes for this webinar, our, expect our expectation is that you're going to leave uh, knowing how to create a logic model, if you didn't already, and how to integrate a logic model into a funding proposal. So in general, you want to focus on changes in skills, attitudes, behaviors um, among the individuals who receive the project's services or products. Okay, moving on to midterm outcomes. So these are changes that are going to result, come about because of those short-term outcomes. So if an individual experiences a change in what they know or what they do, what happens next? That's what we want to articulate here, typically. So for this webinar, you know, it's not enough that you leave the session knowing more about um, logic models. We want you to actually apply the information. So create good logic models and put them into your proposals and put them to other uses. So those are that's what we put as our midterm outcomes here. And so this, for those of you who are applying to ATE, this would happen sometime after you leave the webinar, um, but presumably before the proposal deadline in October. So when it comes to midterm outcomes, um, think about this in terms of articulating the link between the immediate individual outcomes um, to the improvements in the broader context, which is what we're going to get at in long-term outcomes. And you do want to keep the focus here on the target audience, not the project itself. So you're typically not doing the project to benefit the project, right? You're doing it to, for some greater good, for something outside of yourselves, outside of the individuals implementing the project. So the long-term outcomes are the changes you really want and expect to see with regard to the problematic situation or the opportunity for improvement that prompted you to design the project in the first place. 
So the purpose of this webinar is to help you prepare strong, fundable proposals. And we want to see those proposals funded so you can do the important work uh, that's going to help advance the mission of the ATE program or do whatever it is that you're doing to make the world a better place. And of course, there's going to be lots of other factors that's going to influence uh, whether your proposals get funded other than this webinar. So while this is our aim, you know, I'm, what I've done here is I'm just adding a little dotted line here to show that um, we're seeking to make a contribution here. So our efforts alone won't bring about this change. And that's something I would explain in a narrative explanation of this logic model. So in general, for long-term outcomes, um, you really want to focus on improvements in the broader context that you're serving and seeking to impact. So most likely this is going to mean beyond the immediate beneficiaries of your project. Um, and you want to frame these outcomes in terms of addressing that original need or opportunity uh, that spurred the project. I just have a few more pointers about outcomes. So you want to make sure that they really do represent important changes or improvements, that they're not trivial, and that they're realistic, and that they are logically linked to one another and appropriately sequenced. And again, they really should not be about the project. So unless you're doing a strictly organizational development kind of project, they really should be about the broader populations or conditions that you're really seeking to impact with your work. So as you might imagine, uh, as the complexity of a project increases, the level of detail that you can reasonably include goes down, it diminishes. So for our project, for example, we provide webinars, but we do a lot of other things, like we do a newsletter, and we conduct workshops, and we have a blog, we create you know, tools and resources, and we do surveys, and we do lots of things. So in our, in our full-blown logic model of our entire project, you know, we have one box to re represent the, the webinar activity, not three different ones like here. So, in, in, so we would have... Um, we would diminish the amount of detail so that we could show the overall structure of the project. So a good logic model is going to have multiple uses. You can use it in a funding proposal that's going to help reviewers understand your project plan. It can serve as a foundation for planning evaluation. You can use it for project management, like to you know make sure you're on track in terms of doing what you said you were going to do and progressing toward those intended outcomes. And you can use it for communicating with stakeholders about your project, what it's all about. So it's really the first purpose that we're going to focus um, in on the, on the latter, in the latter half of this webinar. So I'm just giving you a little brain break here. Uh, I've thrown a lot at you in this first part of the webinar. And in the next part, the next section of this first part, we're going to go to work together building a logic model from scratch. So I just want to give you a moment to let that information sink in. Uh, and if you have any questions at this point, you know, go ahead, type them in the chat box so they're ready when we do get to the question break. OK, so we've covered the basics. And now we're going to, as I said, build a logic model together for a fictional project that I made up for this purpose. So I'm going to give you an overview of the project. It's called Bio-Inspired Solutions for hum to Human Challenges. And then we're going to create a logic model based on that information. So um, bio-inspired engineering, it's sometimes also called biomimicry, or it relates to biomimicry. And that's the application of um, patterns and strategies that are in the natural world. We apply those to human problems, like what can we learn from this chameleon skin that we could apply to manufacturing advanced materials that we could you know, use in, for different purposes in the human world. So I'm going to share the project abstract with you, and then we're going to create a logic model based on that information. So Chameleon Community College is experiencing under-enrollment in engineering technology and pre-engineering. And this is in spite of a growing demand for technicians among local manufacturers. So to address the problem, the college is developing a general education science course to attract students with, specifically with undeclared majors to these programs. And the interdisciplinary course is really designed to get students excited about bio-inspired engineering. And so it's going to bring to life um, principles from uh, disciplines like biology, design, economics, engineering, and material science uh, through hands-on and computer-based simulations. The project's focus is on attracting students with undeclared majors to this course and then motivating them to pursue degrees in, those, in the engineering areas. So the main activities include uh, completing the course materials, creating a short video with examples of bio-inspired engineering, 
making presentations to admissions counselors, advisors, and faculty about what the, the purpose and focus of the course, and then doing some outreach to students with undeclared majors. So the project is going to leverage existing resources, including simulation software that was developed with prior NSF funding, an advisor, expert advisory panel um, with industry experts, and the college's own videography internship program. So here is the project abstract, so you can refer to it as we build the logic model. Now, in the real world, we'd have a lot more information than just this very short abstract to go on, but it's going to suffice for this exercise. So I would like you to use the chat box, and that should be in the upper right corner of all of your screens, I think. Um, I would like you to use the chat box to indicate what you think are the project's main input. So again, those are the resources that the project is going to utilize to conduct the work. All right, getting going. So Laura's mentioned the simulation software as well as the advisory panel. Seeing a lot of, so the funding, absolutely, right? He is mentioning the NSF funding as well. Sharon's noting the prior NSF award. Yep, so some prior work was done that's going to feed into this. The videography internship program, Kia mentioned. OK, great. So you're digging right into there. You're looking for the clues about this. Um, so I would hone in on that last paragraph. So it lists three specific resources, the software developed with prior funding, an NSF advisory panel, and the college's videography internship program. So it's talking about leveraging those resources. So I would plug those in right here, and along with that NSF funding, which some of you mentioned, because we know that is an important resource as well for this example. So as you'll see, each distinct input is getting its own box in the model. So moving on to activities. What are the project's main activities? So here's the abstract again, which you can scan to help you. Go ahead and use the chat box. Okay, can and Cindy getting right at creating the video, completing the course curriculum, uh, yep, doing outreach. Kimberly's also mentioning developing the course curriculum. There's so many people on this webinar, those are going by really quickly, but I, I see you're all honing it right in on that first paragraph on the second page where, you know, they're very clearly listed, the main activities. So it's pretty obvious. Um, so that part was pretty easy. And that tends to be pretty typical. Like activities, people can get their heads around. It tends to be pretty straightforward. So I'm going to put those in the um, right here in the activities column. And again, each distinct activity is getting its own box. All right, we're going to move on to outputs. So what products, what tangible things is this project going to create? The tangible, what did I say, like tangible artifacts or evidence of, ser of the development or service delivery. Yeah, Karen's mentioning the video and the curriculum. Yes, the course, that's a good point. The whole course would be an output. Um, the videos. Yeah, so you're honing in on those again. Um, and that wasn't as obvious, right? You found them embedded in the list of activities. So the course materials, the promotional video, you could probably characterize the whole course if it can kind of be packaged and exported. Um, a little more effort to, to identify those. And you may have noticed that not every activity has an associated output, and that's OK. Um, so we would, might want to include like the presentations or things like that as an output if there were specific artifacts or takeaways from those. Um, so this might be something that we'd want to investigate further if, if we were working with a project to develop a logic model. So I, I honed in on these two particular ones. There could be others. I think some of you mentioned some, some other good ones. But I, these are the two that I put under outputs. And again, each one gets its own box. So then we're going to move on to short-term outcomes. So what changes does a project intend to bring about in the short term? This one, I will just tell you, it's not going to be as obvious. We're going to have to do some detective work here. 
Okay, Catherine's pointing out that students will take the, the course. Um, Jack's uh, mentioning larger enrollment in the program. That's definitely something we want to see. Students have to know about the course. Good point. Greg's mentioning enrollment's going to increase. A lot of people are honing in on increased enrollment. Okay, so you're getting it. And there, uh, there's a little more variation in what I'm seeing, obviously, than activities, because it wasn't as straightforward. Um, it's not, they're not explicitly stated in the abstract, and you kind of had to do that. Uh, and that that's, that's can be very typical, especially in something like short, like it's abstract. And the way I thought about it, I figured the first thing that students uh, would do would be to enroll in the course itself. And then we are expecting to see their interest in engineering to increase. So these wouldn't necessarily happen at exactly the same time, but those would be the most immediate effects that we're hoping to see. So those would go, I think I jumped ahead of myself, right here. Um, and I've added just a little arrow there that, the, that we're showing that that first outcome is going to precede the second one. So we need students to enroll in the course, and once they're there, we expect to see their interest in engineering to increase. Okay, just a couple more. We're on to midterm outcomes. Um, so what needs to happen as a result of those short-term outcomes that are going to get us closer to addressing that original need for the project? Again, these may or may not be explicitly stated. Yeah, they're going to know more about engineering, going to keep students in the program. They need to complete the course. That's a very good point. Jack's uh, mentioning we're going to have future graduates with, with skills in bioengineering. That's definitely where we want to end up. OK, and you guys are mentioning some other good ones. All right, excellent. So um, the way I was thinking of this, we need to have enrollment in the, those programs increase. So the course is a gateway to those programs, and then also the number of graduates from those programs to increase. So it wouldn't, just increasing enrollment wouldn't be enough, so we're going to link those two. And I put those results here. Again, the first one's preceding the other, so I'm just including a little arrow to indicate that. So we're finally at long-term outcomes. So what is the whole point of this project? And some of you have already touched on this. What is our long-term outcome that we're seeking to achieve? Yep, Cindy's mentioning increased technicians in the workforce for sure. Greg is mentioning graduates in the technicians in industry, absolutely. And the key right there is in the first sentence. So the project really is a solution, a proposed solution, to this problem of an imbalance between supply and demand for engineering technicians in the local workforce. So we're going to frame that as an improvement in the condition that spurred the problem. And this is a good check to make sure you've you're getting where you need to be with your long-term outcomes is like in any proposal you have to present sort of a need or a rationale for a project and those long-term outcomes that you present should be a you know a response should be clearly aligned with the original need for the project so admittedly this is a big problem for one course to address so we would explain elsewhere in you know in the project description that this is a strategy that's contributing to this to solving this problem maybe it won't solve it on its own all right, thank you all so much for sort of jumping into that exercise. And that was a made up example, right? So what do STEM education project logic models look like in the real world? So I emailed everyone who was registered for this webinar as of a couple of weeks ago and asked for examples. And I was really pleased that um, Several people responded so I could share some real world examples with you. And we're not going to go into these in depth, but I just want to show you kind of the, the variation in the way these are presented. So this example uses a simple table format. So it, you know, it kind of shows that you don't have to necessarily use a fancy kind of graphic as long as you can illustrate the logical relationship between those elements. So in this example, there I, they have a problem statement at the top that, that really clearly identifies the issue that the project is addressing. And then the other different piece here is the assumptions along the bottom, which talk about the context and the conditions in which the project is going to operate. So those are two nice additions that really, uh, I think, helps to sharpen the focus on what the project is all about and, and how it 
what it kind of needs to, to be able to do the work. And this model was informed by a logic model manual published by the Institute of Education Sciences, and there's a link for that manual on our resource handout. And you'll probably all also notice that they've used arrows within the boxes to really highlight the pathways by which change occurs. And when you have several components, you know, distinct components to your work that are leading to different kinds of outcomes, that is a nice addition to show how these pieces fit together. And here we have um, an example that uses very similar categories to what I just presented. We see a little splash of color. It's very nice and clean. I know it's a little, uh, a lot of these are blurry because they're so reduced, but um, you can kind of see the overall look of it. It looks very nice. And and this example was developed using the University of Wisconsin's logic model guide. And that one happens to characterize outputs as activities, which is different with, than what I presented. Um, but again, as I noted, there's a lot of variation in how different um, groups and scholars will conceptualize the logic model element. So your takeaway here is just for to aim for internal consistency. So whatever definitions and operationalized, you know, ways of thinking about this that you're going to use. You just want to apply them consistently in your model. But I like the way they've used color in this example to distinct the different elements of the model. So there's some, uh, just a few real world, real world examples. And if you want to see more, if you, you know, search on, search the web for logic models and images, you will find countless examples in a huge variety of formats. So, you know, find an example that appeals to you that's, you know, maybe similar to the work that you're doing. Follow a guide that works for you and just my, you know, aim for consistency, efficiency, and logic in your logic model because they all are going to look different and even use different definitions. So to help you get started, we have a logic model template for ATE projects and centers and it includes question prompts and examples for each of the logic model elements that we've discussed. Um, we've created it in PowerPoint, so it's really easy to edit and start um, creating your own logic model. So now it is time for our first question break. So I'm going to turn it over to Miranda, and she will let me know what questions you have. OK, great. Thank you so much, Lori. And so I will now address questions from the audience and make sure if you have any more questions, please continue to type them in the chat box. So our first viewer question is, are logic models required by funding agencies or just suggested by funding agencies? I, I think what you'll find is that they are required for some, um, but not all. Like I think even within the NSF program, some program, I mean NSF agency, some programs will request logic models with the proposals and others won't. So for example, in the ATE program, they are not required. Um, we think they're a good addition. if, if you know, if you can make it work in your proposal, and we'll talk about that later. So different funders have different requirements. You, you know, it's not even funder specific. You, like, you have to go to the specific funder, but then the specific, you know, program um, that they're uh, putting forth, you know, requests for proposals or whatever for. I know in the CDC program, uh, it's become, um, why do I keep saying program? CDC agency, it has, uh, now, I, th I think for many uh, people who are applying for funding, it's, it's an expectation that they'll have a logic model. But you just have to look to where you're applying and, and find specifically. But some do require it. Thank you. The second question is, could you shed light on the difference or similarities between a logic model and a theory of change? Um, that's a really good question, and I tried to tackle that in a recent, in the recent newsletter that we just published. Um, and you know, it's, 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 there's so much overlap in these. So the, I don't think there's like a right or wrong answer here. I'll tell you what I think, okay? So, um, I think a, a logic model is a way of depicting a theory of change. So a theory of change is your, uh, belief about, you know, how what you're going to do is bring, going to bring about change. So and it's based on evidence, which include, you know, research, theory, uh, experience. But I think when you write up a theory of change, it's going to get a lot more detailed than what you see typically in a logic model. I think you'll see more detail about, like, when you see arrows in a logic model, like, the, if we do this, it will lead to this. A theory of change, a robust theory of change will have, um, 
explanation of why that's believed to be the case, what's the, you know, what evidence is there to think that if we do this, then that will happen. But there is quite a lot of overlap, and I think most logic models are depictions of theories of change, um, but a theory of change itself, you know, I think has, tends to have um, more detail behind it. That's my take on it, but I will mention that I did try to tackle that issue of what theory of changes is. Um, versus a logic model in our recent newsletter, which is on our website, if you go to the newsletter section, and actually point to a really good article that uh, elaborates on that much more um, than I'm able to right now. Okay. The next question is, should the activities in a logic model be listed as nouns, like here, or could they also be written as verbs with action words? I suppose either one is fine. Yeah, absolutely you could write. My recommendation there is to be consistent. So I just I have a thing about that. So if you're going to write them as verbs, write them all as verbs. If you're going to write them as nouns, do them all as nouns. But I think um, I think writing them as verbs, you know, I actually didn't even think about that when I was creating this one, but you know, really underscores that it is an action that's being taken. So I think that's great. Um, again, just be consistent in, in how you uh, present and formulate each each of the segments of the, like if you, all the activities should be um, framed as verbs if that's the way you're going to go. So how much time should be allotted for short, mid, and long-term outcomes? You know, I don't think there's a standard answer to that. I think it's all relative to um, to what you're doing and the type of change you're seeking to bring about. Uh, you know, I present an example which where we're expecting to see pretty quick turnaround, at least on short-term outcomes. Um, and even, even lo so our lo long-term outcome in the webinar example is going to be within about, um, you know, it's less than six months. It's like four months in terms, actually, well, for funding, it's probably more like a year. But, you know, if you're tackling big problems, that time scale is going to expand. So it, it just has to be reasonable for what you're, what you're proposing. There's no, there's no set thing where you can say, oh, all midterm outcomes occur within, you know, 12 to 18 months after the initial activity. There's no hard and fast rule like that. But it is good to elaborate on that when you're describing it in, in narrative form. And if you, you could even include it specifically in the model itself to designate those time frames if you wanted to. Okay. Would it um, help to have assumptions listed about each of the pathways through the logic model? I really like the addition of problem statements and assumptions. Um, I have to admit, I've never put assumptions in a logic model, so I can't give a lot of advice there. And I think if other people are, you know, in the want to share their uh, recommendations in the chat, that is a good idea. I think, um, especially when you're really diving deep into theory of change and articulating how things happen, you really do have to um, explicate the assumptions of, like, you know, the conditions that are necessary. You know, if we do this, then that will happen, but it requires these conditions. Um, I think that's a nice addition, especially when you're, like I said, really going into a lot more detail about how you expect change to take place. Okay. So does every activity need to be linked to an input? I don't think you need to link act inputs to activities. Again, every project is different. So if that's if it makes sense for your project, then do it. But like, um, if in the webinar example I gave, like all of those things, the funding, the expertise, the other resource, they're all feeding into the development and delivery of the webinar. So I didn't need to, you know, draw individual arrows. Now, sometimes when you have activities, activities that are only, some activities may only lead to some types of outcomes. And if that is the case for your project, I would, you know, show those pathways with arrows. So I think you use arrows when it, when it's necessary and when it helps people understand the, the, the logic and the structure of your project. Okay. How can logic models be used to assess progress to date and outcomes post-intervention? Is it only something that's strictly for pre-planning or can it be used in assessment? Well, I, I really think you should be checking in on them regularly. I think a logic model should be a living document that you tweak, you know, if things aren't going, if your change is not coming around that you, as you thought, you can tweak the, the logic model to fit, better fit the reality. Um, it's great for evaluation, for planning the evaluation, and then as you get the evaluation results in, you can check the results in relation to what kinds of outcomes you are expecting to see. So I 
don't think you should just create a logic model, put in a proposal, and then never look at it again. I do think it should be part of a regular, um, as you're doing evaluation, as you're doing project management, as you're monitoring your work, it's it's a great tool to to check in with and tweak if necessary if, if you don't think you didn't seem like you got it right in the planning stage. Okay. It seems that the output shifted from outputs of the experience, uh, which may have included elements of recruitment, to outputs solely of the project or the course. Is that accurate? I think there may be talking about outcomes. So the way uh, I the projects that I work on tend to be like this. So, and I'm not saying this is all projects, but um, where the immediate outcomes are going to be at the individual level, and then the the mid and uh, perhaps the mid and definitely the long-term outcomes are going to shift to a broader context. So, in that, um, in the in the case an example we built together, uh, we directly impacted those students, but the larger effect that we're seeking is, you know, local workforce. Um, so it isn't so much about those individuals anymore. It's about meeting a regional uh, demand for workers. So it does, ex in the examples that I gave, and it tends to be the focus of my work, the, the outcome, the scope of the outcome does tend to broaden as we sh go down the line. That doesn't mean it, it's that way for every project. So, like, this is my experience. Okay. Uh, two final questions. Uh, do external evaluators need to be involved in developing the logic model? Um, I think it helps. Uh, you have to keep in mind that not all evaluators are necessarily experts in logic models. I do think all project leaders are experts on their projects. Um, I wouldn't leave logic model development strictly to an external evaluator. Um, I think it can be a collaborative process between the project staff and, and an evaluator. Um, uh, it, it's an iterative process, so logic, uh, excuse me, a evaluator may take the lead based on some reading that they did, and then bring it back to show uh, the project people, and they can they can work on it together. Uh, often, an evaluator will have a good eye to, for you know, are these reasonable outcomes? Um, is this are these logically linked? Uh, does this set up set us up for a good evaluation and things like that? So I think they definitely have usually have some experts expertise to bring to the work. Question is, do the outcomes need to happen within the grant period? I think they, the, the not necessarily, but I think you need to specify that. Um, I think they can go beyond the, um, than beyond the funding period, especially for short projects. But I, I do think it's, I think it's okay to extend your outcomes beyond your funding period because often what you're trying to uh, serve is a larger, a larger need and a, a, a larger issue in your context, in your community, and in, in, in your environment. Um, the ATE program has a large mission to improve the quantity and quality of technicians in, you know, areas that kind of, that have to do with. Um, national competitiveness. So that's that's a big result, and I think it is important for projects to show how they're feeding into that, even if you know they're not going to directly bring about that th their long-term objective in the funding period. Thank you, Lori, and thank you to the audience for um, the questions. We'll move on to the next section, but please may make sure you type them any more questions in the chat box, and I'll turn it back over to Lori now. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you for all those questions. And again, this is, I'm answering based on my experience. So I hope you all will do your own, you know, reading and, and study and exploration of this topic. Look at other examples. Um, we do have some really good resources listed on our resource handout. So I'm not the, I don't have all the answers on this. But, um, okay, so in this part of the webinar, we're going to, focus on how to integrate a logic model into a funding proposal. And this came about because several months ago, a former ATE program officer mentioned to me that he was seeing more mo logic models in ATE proposals, but he was noticing they were just kind of tacked on and really didn't relate too well to the proposal content. Um, so that comment from him was pretty much the impetus of this webinar, particularly this section of the webinar. So. In this part of the webinar, which is a much shorter section, we're really going to hone in on this use of a logic model, including it in a funding proposal.
So first of all, where the heck do you even put a logic model in an ATE proposal? Um, I'm going to share a couple of options with you, and these might work for other uh, types of programs as well. Um, but you do, you know, as I mentioned before, if you're applying to other funders or programs, you really need to look at their specific guidelines or requirements. So here's the components for all NSF proposals. Now, it's the second item that is the project description. So it's that 15-page narrative account of uh, what you want to do, why you want to do it, and, and how you're going to implement. So if your logic model is relatively small and can fit on half a page or so, this is definitely where I would recommend putting it just to ensure that re reviewers are going to see it. So if it takes... Uh, a whole page, which is typical, I would say, you could still put it here in your project description, but um, you know, do so only if it doesn't displace other critical information. So if you're proposing a relatively small project, and, and ATE projects may range from like $250,000 to $5 million, so if you're on the smaller side and it's less complex, you can probably include it in the, in the project narrative without it encroaching on other important content. So when I wrote our last proposal, I, I started it out. I intended to keep it in the narrative part in the 15 pages, and the, but I did end up bumping it into the supplementary documents section. And that is where, for NSF proposals, you include your data management plan and uh, things like letters of commitment. But I do want to give you a word of caution here, OK? Uh, this quote is from the NSF grant proposal guide. You can read it for yourself, but it basically translates to, if it's really important for reviewers to see it, don't put it in supplementary documents. And this is because reviewers are not required to review supplementary documents. And NSF doesn't want people using this part of the proposal package as a way to get around that 15-page limit for project descriptions. Now, I think the ATE program is actually more lenient than some other NSF programs because the solicitation suggests including things like uh, including samples of curriculum materials, uh, external reviews of materials, draft instructional modules, things like that. Um, but they also recommend to, to keep it at 30 pages or less of supplemental documentation. So just be aware that including a logic model in the supplementary documents is probably just fine for ATE proposals, but there may be different guidelines for other programs in NSF. But getting your logic model into the proposal sort of physically is just part of the issue. You really need to have it well integrated with the content of your project description. So that's why we're going to address this question now of what is the relationship between a logic model and a project description. So it's that 15-page narrative account of what you're proposing. And according to the ATE program solicitation, the project description should address these things that I have listed here, starting with results of prior support going through dissemination plan. They don't necessarily need to be presented in that order, but these are the topics they want covered. So if you have a logic model, it really has to align with what you describe in terms of your activities, deliverables, objectives, and goals. Now, the AT program and NSF, neither of them really defines or distinguishes between goals and objectives, so don't you don't have to split hairs here, I guess, is what I'm saying. The bulk of your project description is going to be devoted to explaining what your project is going to do, why it's, you know, proposing what it's proposing. Um, so what are the activities, what are the results, regardless of the specific labels that you use. But everything in your logic model should be addressed in the project narrative. Uh, and there shouldn't be any important elements that are in the narrative in terms of how the project's going to be implemented and its outcomes that are left out of the logic model. So I'm going to show you one way to make sure they're lined up. So it's always a good idea to use headings to help reviewers navigate proposals. They have a lot of information to consume, you know, looking at several proposals at once. So headings can really help people uh, see, see the pathway of what you're presenting. And you can use these headings to really underscore the relationship between what's in the narrative description and what's in the logic model. So you want to make it really obvious to reviewers how one relates to the other. 
So activities is a major heading in our logic model, and it can be a major heading in our narrative like this. And each box in the logic model can get its own subheading in the narrative. So it's really clear that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the logic model elements and the, the main parts of the narrative. So that's for activities. So for outputs or deliverables, um, since those are the results, direct results of project activities, it makes sense to me to describe them under the activity headings rather than having a separate section of the proposal develop, devoted to outputs. You can highlight the correspondence to the logic model by putting the specific deliverables in bold. Sorry, didn't mean to go ahead like that. Or even in a third level heading um, related to each activity. So each output is really easy to see in the narrative, really pops out. So OK, next are outcomes. And dealing with outcomes in the proposal is somewhat less straightforward. So intended outcomes, which is the language of you know, logic models, really isn't the language that's used in ATE program solicitation. And yeah, so program solicitations like request for proposal or RFP for those of you who aren't from NSF world. Um, so the ATE program solicitation, as I as I pointed out, mentions goals and objectives, not you know necessarily outcomes. So I'm going to show you a couple options. If you want to stick to the language of the solicitation, which talks about goals and objectives, my suggestion would be to present your short-term outcomes as objectives. Because these are the things you have more control over than those more distal outcomes. And again, you can use subheadings to clearly link the narrative to the logic model. So for each short-term outcome, we have a subheading. And here's where you can get specific about your targets. And we touched on that earlier. So I've highlighted some sample language here. Reviewers often want to see very specific, measurable objectives. And you can express those in the narrative or even in a table format. Uh, because that is important to include. You don't necessarily need to include it in the model itself. So the mid and long term outcomes, if you wanted to take this approach, could be framed as the goals in the narrative. Um, again, just showing a one to one correspondence between what's in the model and the subheading or the main sections of the proposal. Here's an alternative. If you want to use this sort of outcome-oriented language of the logic model and present the same information, it could look like this. Um, be aware that the style may not be, and this, this language may not be familiar to NSF reviewers, and you definitely don't want to leave them kind of shaking their head saying, but, but what are the goals and objectives? There's no goals and objectives. So if you do this, you might want to, you know, use the goals and objectives language somewhere so it's really clear that you aren't just glossing over those. This all boils down to kind of one simple rule here, uh, which is about lining, aligning the logic model elements with the project's narrative description. But there's a couple other ways your logic model's content should, um, should be integrated into your proposal. This is also where you're going to explain, the, the project description is also where you're going to explain your evaluation plan. So you want to make sure your evaluation questions and your data collection plan really do line up with what's in the logic model. So a good guideline or rule of thumb would be to have evaluation questions and indicators for at least every major column of the logic model, if not every box in the model. And one of the resources I'm going to tell you about in the next, after the next question break actually demonstrates how to do that. You also need a dissemination plan. So to show that dissemination isn't just an afterthought, you can include dissemination as a core activity in your logic model. So that is that. I'm going to turn things over to Miranda for any more questions you have. OK, thanks, Lori. So we do have a few questions here. And please make sure to continue to type your questions in the chat box. So the first question is, if a donor has provided funds based on a logic model that was originally proposed, is it acceptable to revise that model throughout the course of the project, or is that usually done in conjunction with the donor? Well, I, would, I can't answer for donors, OK? My, my common sense part of me says a logic model is a, basically a prediction about how you're going to bring about change. So if you're finding that isn't, wasn't an accurate prediction, it was not a good theory, then there, I wouldn't see much point in holding on to that. Um, now, if you're talking about uh, changing 
major aspects of implementation that may require a check-in with the funder. I know in NSF we have a lot of latitude to adapt what we're doing to, to maximize results. There are certain rules about like if you're going to, you know, we have major budgetary implications, you have to check with a program officer. But if you're sticking with the overall kind of sort of per mission of your of your project, and generally the activities aren't, you know, too radically changed, you don't have to go back to the funder. Can't speak uh, about what's expected from other donors, however. Okay. The bye. Model. Miranda, your audio cut out on me. I'm going to guess I, that it was one of the best to time to, are you, okay, go ahead. I can. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, when is the best time to create a narrative for a logic model? Well, I think what, what I found, again, this is my personal experience, I found that uh, I do them together. And often, when you're trying to, or I shouldn't say often, I found instances when I was trying to explain what was in the logic model in, you know, in writing, I go, wow, that, I can't explain how that happens. I can't explain how we get from this activity to that outcome. Looked nice in the model, but now that I'm trying to explain it, it's not making sense. So, you know, doing them back and forth, for me, works. Um, I think... I, I think, yeah, for me, I would recommend do, working in, in tandem. You know, it's a chicken or egg thing, but I definitely would see that the narrative writing, the narrative explanation, and the logic de model development is happening in tandem and going back and forth between the two to make sure you really get it right. Okay. And then the final question that we have for this section is, should you include actual evaluation activities in the logic model so that reviewers can see the direct relationship between the evaluation and the activity? Well, I'll tell you what I've done, I have done in the past, is I'll actually just add the evaluation questions to the model, kind of along the main uh, com model components to show how the evaluation questions line up to what we're proposing and expecting to happen in the project. And then I use a table in the proposal or the evaluation plan to uh, get specific about what indicators and data collection methods and sources I'll use to answer those questions. So you don't want to over clutter the model with everything, you know, like all project management and evaluation and all that. But I do think it is good to point out like how you are covering, addressing the aspects of the project that are presented in the logic model through the evaluation. Okay, thank you. So we've reached the end of those questions. I'll now turn it back over to Lori. Uh, remember to please keep your questions coming in the chat box. Thank you. All right, so just a little bit of bonus material I promised you. So uh, since 2009, the webinar we've done this time every year has always been um, a comprehensive guide or overview on how to develop evaluation plans for ATE proposals. Now, we went in a different direction this year, but I, I know some of you probably still want and need more guidance on evaluation plans in general. So I wanted to just share with you a few of the resources we have for this. And links for all these resources, as well as others I've, I've mentioned in the webinar, are included in the, the handout that looks like this. It's on our website, so you can get it at any point in time now. So first, we have a pretty comprehensive checklist for evaluation planning for ATE proposals. And it's going to, it identifies all the places in a proposal where evaluation elements should show up. So it has lots of other links to other resources that's going to help you with different aspects. It's, it's again, five pages, so it's pretty detailed. And if you don't look at anything else and you're proposing to the, to the ATE program, I would encourage you to check out this document. You can also watch a recording of the webinar uh, we presented last year on developing evaluation plans, and you can access the presentation slides from that webinar. And in that webinar, in, throughout that webinar in different places, we've interspersed advice from these experts that you see on the screen on this slide. Um, they have different perspectives and different kinds of expertise on ATE projects and evaluation, so this webinar is really chock full of good information. For those of you who've had prior, uh, previous NSF awards, I suggest you see our checklist for writing up results from prior NSF support sections of proposals. So this document includes both the NSF requirements and our suggestions for strengthening these parts of proposals. 
And finally, uh, the latest uh, post in Evaluate's blog was just, oops, I think I skipped over uh, something. So one more, uh, one more webinar I would encourage you to look at. So this one we did back in March 2016, and it's on small project evaluation. But what I think you'll be interested in this part is uh, demonstrations of evaluation budgeting, evaluation question development, um, creating evaluation data collection plans, and dividing up internal and external evaluation responsibilities. So from this uh, resource, you can get the recording, the presentation slides, and the resource handout. And here's the blog that I wanted to mention. Um, it was just published today. It's based on uh, Leslie Goodyear's experience as a program officer and an evaluation specialist at NSF. And she shares um, her advice for present presenting strong evaluation plans in NSF proposals. So I hope that you'll find these useful as you go about your work. And if you have any questions or feedback on them, please let me know. Do stay tuned for just a couple more minutes because we're going to have our feedback survey coming up next. And that's super, super important for us that you do that. And it's very short and painless. But first, I want to um, make sure that those of you who already have NS or, excuse me, ATE projects, you know about our upcoming workshop on outcome evaluation at the ATE Principal Investigators Conference. Also, ATE evaluators, um, you can apply for funding from Evaluate to assist with travel costs to attend the conference. So check out our website if you want to learn more about that. OK, we are, we are going to have time to take a few more questions if there are any. But first, we want to make sure you do not leave without completing our feedback survey. It's, again, quite short and painless, very important to us. Just uh, click on the link that you should see on your screen now, and the survey will open for you. So while folks get into that, if there's any more questions we should take, Miranda, we can do that now. OK, so thank you, Lori. Um, at this time, it looks like we've answered most of the audience questions. Uh, however, I encourage anybody that has a remaining question to please enter them into the chat box. Um, and and um, so, Lori, if you have any parting uh, comments or anything that you'd like to add. Um, no, just if anybody had any issues with opening the survey link that should appear in a little box on your screen, it's also in the chat box. Again, it's very important uh, to us that you do that. I want to thank everybody for coming and all your great questions. And again, I encourage you to do some reading and research on your own. And I am, if you have questions or you would like me to look at something you're working on, I'd be happy uh, to, to, to respond to uh, you know, individual questions via email. My uh, email address is easy to find on the Evaluate website. So um, no, I'll, I'll just say thank you, everybody. And thank you, Miranda. OK. Well, um, so we've reached our, the end of our time together today. And uh, I would like to take a moment to thank everyone for attending. I'd like to thank the audience for their participation. And I would definitely like to thank uh, Mike Lisecki, Janet Penhorn, and Tim Suchomsky for all of their help today. So remember, please uh, continue to fill out that Evaluate survey. And we hope to see you next time.